Now is a time of crisis in the United States. The country has been galvanized by the video of George Floyd's killing by Derek Chauvin, a white Minneapolis police officer who, along with two others, pinned a handcuffed Floyd down by the neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds while George pleaded for his life and called out for his mother. Shalvin continued to kneel on his neck long after George lost consciousness. George Floyd's death is joined by the recent killings, such as the jogger Ahmad Arbery by white vigilantes in Georgia and the EMT Breonna Taylor by police in Louisville. There's a biblical word for a time like this, kairos. It's a form of the word for time, but it doesn't mean clock time or calendar time. Kairos is a time of judgment, when the truth is revealed and justice is demanded, when people and whole societies are judged by their actions. The frightening thing about this crisis is how decidedly not unusual it is. Such violence happens every day and only gathers attention when caught on video. We can add these people's names to the sad litany of black men and women who have died in the past few years under profoundly questionable circumstances in encounters with law enforcement. And that recent list joins centuries of violence against black people from the earliest foundations of what would become the United States. Today, police are seven times more likely to use force against black people than white. Black men are 3.5 times more likely to, than whites to be killed by law enforcement. Nearly one in a thousand black men will die this way in the United States. Numbers that are far out of proportion with any other advanced society in the world. These videos and the people in the street are forcing us to see what we have found too easy to ignore. How will we respond? By we here, I should specify I'm speaking to the white members of our parish. We are a predominantly but not exclusively white parish. I don't want to ignore the people of Keller in our parish, many of whom are feeling profound pain at this moment. But I want to address white parishioners' particular obligation to face this crisis so we can all be a better parish together. And at this moment of Kairos, we can also say perhaps be a better part of the broader church in Dayton which is much more diverse than our parish, but with whom we have very little interaction. This state of affairs doesn't seem to be viewed as a particularly pressing problem by either the archdiocese or us, as far as I've been able to tell over the past 11 years. So what will we do in response to this moment, to this kairos in which much that is hidden is being revealed? Father Brian Massingale, one of the leading voices on the problem of racism in the Catholic Church, describes racism as a blindness, a spiritual cataract that limits our vision, that determines, in his words, whom we do and do not notice. Racism is revealed today in a lack of empathy and profound indifference. It's a pervasive lack of concern and social callousness in a majority of society to the horrors and scandals in our midst. Racism narrows our vision, leads us to draw the circle of concern too narrowly. How does it do this? It doesn't work simply through explicit, avowed racism. Although I want to stress, there's plenty of that around. I grew up with it in my family and in the church I grew up in. Explicit racism. It's still a powerful force in our nation as we speak. But racism also works more subtly through implicit judgments and biases, sensibilities about what is respectable, how people should act and look. These are harder to sense. And white Catholics have a lot of work of conversion to do on both fronts, to confront this sickness of the American soul, which infects so many of us. But there's a problem that's much broader than explicit or even implicit racism. It's structural racism. The American religious imagination doesn't deal with systemic problems very well. We want to look into our hearts and ask God's grace to help us do better. But real conversion calls us to open our eyes and look around and work to change structures as well. 
There is systematic, unequal treatment built into American history and the current moment. This is often called white privilege. Now, privilege is a hard word for many of us. Who feels privileged? We live in a highly insecure society. Many of us live paycheck to paycheck. We're two paychecks from bankruptcy. Half of the United States cannot handle an unexpected $400 medical or auto repair bill. That would send them over the edge. There are six payday lenders within a mile of this altar. Our economy ruthlessly sorts people into winners and strugglers. We worry that our children will not live as well as we do, that one adolescent mistake will put them on the path to a life of struggle. In our society, so many have to work hard just to get by. Talk of privilege can seem cruel. As a friend once said to me, so many lives come down to inches and seconds. Let me talk about systematic racism by talking about my own family history. And we're pretty ordinary. My grandfather's parents came from Lithuania at the turn of the century, and they never learned English. My grandfather, like many children of immigrants, was their translator. He left school in eighth grade to go to work. He bore the injuries from his first non-union job for the rest of his life. He owned three houses in succession starting in a row house with a grassless yard in a neighborhood that's now an overpass, and retiring in a stable neighborhood of small, well-maintained homes. The federal government had created the FHA insurance program to make, insure, make mortgages affordable to the working class. FHA-backed loans made my grandfather's home ownership and asset accumulation possible. He worked hard his entire life, retired on Social Security and a UAW pension, and left an estate about five times his final salary when he died, mostly in the form of the value of his home. I'd like to compare his life with another life, the life of Clyde Ross, who was profiled in an article by ta Coates in Atlantic Magazine. Clyde fought in World War II, a little younger than my grandfather. After the war, he moved to Chicago, like many black people, he was escaping the racism of the South. His home in Mississippi, where his father and family were cheated out of a farm and forced, to be life, forced into life as sharecroppers. Clyde got a good job with Campbell's Soup and wanted to buy a house to get him out of the slums and his family out of the slums. No mortgages were available to him. The only neighbors, neighborhoods where he could buy were redlined declared uninsurable by the FHA. So he bought from a housing dealer, not a bank, but didn't have a mortgage from a bank. He paid $26,000 in 1961, which is a lot of money, for a house the dealer had just purchased for 12. He had a rent contract. It seemed like a mortgage, but it wasn't. There was no equity. Miss one payment and you lose it all. He worked two additional jobs to make the payment. His wife took work in the city. They had to take their kids out of private school and couldn't be there for them after school. Their attempts, so similar to my grandfather's, to get out of the slums, resulted in exploitation and servitude. At the end of his life, Floyd had paid a fortune for a home that had little value. Both worked hard. But there were structures in place that caused radically different outcomes. The outcome isn't measured in how much money they left to their children, but in the lifetime of stability, security, and safety, or of economic insecurity and unsafe neighborhoods that their housing options brought with them. My grandparents' generation were divided between those for whom a factory job could buy a house and a stable home or a life of toil with little time for care of children. These weren't private prejudices. They were government policies and accepted business practices. Those FHA housing surveys were enormously powerful. As a spiritual practice, I encourage you, for, you to search for them online. Ohio State has them, and the Dayton Daily News has them for Dayton. The neighborhoods redlined in the 1937 survey are still poor today. You don't have to take someone's word for it. You can read the actual documents. 
Unlike other questions on the questionnaires regarding inhabitants, the entry for Negro says yes or no. A single black family officially, officially required downgrading the entire neighborhood. Let's jump a generation to my life. I grew up in a non-affluent suburb of Pittsburgh. My family was there because the neighborhood we previously lived in had been integrated through busing, so we left. My friends and I had numerous encounters with police in my youth, some for things that a prosecutor could have easily and legitimately classified as a felony. I remember the weekend before I was to leave for college, the first person in my family to ever do so. Somehow, I was racing another car through a theater parking lot, and I got caught. It was careless, reckless, and dangerous. I could have killed someone. The grim-faced cop demanded our driver's license and walked to the car. My future crumbled before my eyes. He came back in a minute and told us to go home. That was it. The phrase I remember most, boys, call it a night. I had a friend, a very bad influence, who was finally caught after dozens of home burglaries. His sentence? He was sent to a residential trade school and taught to be a mechanic. None of us were ever handcuffed. We certainly never had a gun aimed at us. Criminal vandalism? You're going to have to work it off with the owner. In every encounter with the police, the attitude was, these boys have a future and we can't let them mess it up. Now, I've worked hard to get where I am, and I've done well. But like my grandfather who worked hard before me, the wind was at my back. Think about all those points where things have, could have gone differently, inches and seconds. I came from a stable home with parents who came from stable homes, all underwritten by federal loans, guarantees. Criminality was treated as a phase, something parents, not the criminal justice system, would deal with. At that crucial moment when I was about to leave for college, I got a break. No handcuffs, no charges, no knee on my neck. Roll those dice again, or should we say stack that deck differently? And I still work hard, but things that would have turned out much worse because of my adolescent screw up. That privilege is woven through all my hard work, all the hard work of my families. That's through all the things that my family counts as our achievements, that's very hard for us to efface. That there might be an asterisk on there, like in a track and field record, the wind was blowing fast at their back. And it's even harder to face the fact that the wind was blowing hard in the face of some of the people we were running the race with. We've worked hard. We've worried. We struggle with anxiety and we've made things happen, right? But in a system that was opening doors for us. Right privilege works that way. There's no obvious payoff moment when we get an official immunity card and a large bank account. Everyone has to work for what they have. But some do so in neighborhoods whose poverty in 1937 was officially sanctioned by the local and federal government and is still poor to this day. Where police view young men not as people with futures, but as threats to society. I recently heard a woman from West Dayton speak at a protest. She described a normal day in the life of a young family, the struggle to get the kids ready for school and daycare, to fill up the minivan and get everyone where they need to go and get to work on time. It's a chaos of fussy kids and car seats that many of us know. Driving fast to make up lost time, she doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. Pulled over, records run, kids crying uncontrollably, afraid she'll be shot. Late to school, late to work, inches and seconds, generation after generation, working hard with very different outcomes. The challenge for those of us with white privilege is that we don't easily see it. And we assume that things are the same for everyone else. It's so much easier to not know. I want to focus on that as the moral challenge. The biggest problem we face is not red-faced, screaming, spittle-strewn racism. The problem we face is that it is so very, very easy for white people to go through life with no idea 
how unjust our system is. Now, this is something the Bible talks about. In Matthew 25, Jesus describes the final judgment of the nations. The unjust protest, Lord, when did we see you? Jesus says, he will answer them, amen, I say to you, what you did not do for, those, for one of the least of these ones, you did not do for me. They aren't judged for raving hatred, but for their ignorance, their refusal to see. How will we as a nation, with our history, with our ignorance of the suffering we built into the system, fare in that judgment? They didn't see sit with that. What don't we see? Think about how hard it is to answer that question. I'm not sitting here with the answer, but sit with the question. What don't I see? How might we begin to see? Who do we know? Who do we associate with? Where do we live? Where do we shop? Where do we eat? Do we leave the white bubble? Where do we get our information? Does our choice of news network and social media expose us to the voices and experiences of black people? How do we think? Do we have mental shields that protect us from considering how bad things are? Do we invoke like a mantra, black on black crime, or feel the need to stress that the victims of police killings were no angels? Once we realize how hard it is to know what we don't see, we can accept the challenging work of finding out. To read books like Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow, which retells history in a way that makes clear the systemic racism that we've built into the way our nation works, or Leila Saad's Me and White Supremacy, which will be a book read with the Dayton Daily News, organized by Amelia Robinson over the next month. Dayton is doing that. Perhaps we could join in that. I want to end by going back to our vulnerability and anxiety, inches and seconds. Life in our society is hard. None of us feels privileged. And I think spiritually, we can all begin there with our fears and vulnerabilities, our worries about our children, and expand out to imagine how much more difficult things are for those on the receiving end of racism. Christianity doesn't promise happiness or a life free of pain. It does promise that love is stronger than evil, that love can empower us to stand together in solidarity and overcome evil. As black Catholic theologian Son Copeland notes, solidarity is made possible by the loving self-gift of the crucified Christ, whose cross is its origin, its standard, and its judge. A powerful statement. That is what is expected of us. Copeland concludes, only those who follow the example of the crucified and struggle on the side of the exploited, despised and poor, will discover him at their side.